Chapter One of A Daughter of Today. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. A Daughter of Today by Sarah Jeanette Duncan. Chapter One. Miss Kimsey dropped into an armchair in Mrs. Leslie Bell's drawing room and crossed her small, dusty feet before her while she waited for Mrs. Leslie Bell. Sitting there, thinking a little of how tired she was and a great deal of what she had come to say, Miss Kimsey enjoyed a sense of consideration that came through the ceiling with the muffled sound of rapid footsteps in the chamber above. Mrs. Bell would be down in a minute, the maid had said miss kimsey was inclined to forgive a greater delay with this evidence of hasteful preparation going on overhead the longer she had to ponder her mission the better and she sat up nervously straight pondering it tracing with her parasol a sage green block in the elderly aestheticated pattern of the carpet miss kimsey was thirty-five with a pale oblong little face that looked younger under its softening bang of fair curls across the forehead she was a buff and gray-colored creature with a narrow square chin and narrow square shoulders and a flatness and straightness about her everywhere that gave her rather the effect of a wedge to which the big black straw hat she wore tilted a little on one side somehow conduced miss kimsey might have figured anywhere as a representative of the new england feminine surplus there was a distinct suggestion of character under her unimportant little features and her profession was proclaimed in her person apart from the smudge of chalk on the sleeve of her jacket she had been born and brought up and left over in illinois however in the town of sparta illinois she had developed her conscience there and no doubt if one knew it well it would show peculiarities of local expansion directly connected with hot corn-bread for breakfast as opposed to the accredited diet of legumes upon which consciences arrive at such successful maturity in the east it was at all events a conscience in excellent controlling order it directed miss kimsey for example to teach three times a week in the boys night school through the winter no matter how sharply the wind blew off lake michigan in addition to her daily duties at the high school where for ten years she had imparted instruction in the english branches translating chaucer into the modern dialect of sparta illinois for the benefit of miss elfrida bell among others it had sent her on this occasion to see mrs leslie bell and miss kimsey could remember circumstances under which she had obeyed her conscience with more alacrity it isn't said miss kimsey with internal discouragement as if i knew her well miss kimsey did not know mrs bell at all well mrs bell was president of the browning club and miss kimsey was a member they met too in the social jumble of fancy fairs in aid of the new church organ they had a bowing acquaintance that is mrs bell had miss kimsey's part of it was responsive and she always gave a thought to her boots and her gloves when she met mrs bell it was not that the spartan social circle which mrs bell adorned had any vulgar prejudice against the fact that miss kimsey earned her own living more than one of its ornaments had done the same thing and miss kimsey's relations were all in grain and obviously respectable it was simply that none of the kimseys prosperous or poor had ever been in society in sparta for reasons which sparta itself would probably be unable to define and this one was not likely to be thrust among the elect because she taught school and enjoyed life upon a scale of ethics mrs bell's drawing-room was a slight distraction to miss kimsey's nervous thoughts the little school-teacher had never been in it before and it impressed her it's just what you would expect her parlour to be she said to herself looking furtively round she could not help her sense of impropriety she had always been taught that it was very bad manners to observe anything in another person's house 
but she could not help looking either she longed to get up and read the names of the books behind the glass doors of the tall bookcase at the other end of the room for the sake of the little quiver of respectful admiration she knew they would give her but she did not dare to do that her eyes went from the bookcase to the photogravure of doré's entry into jerusalem under which three japanese dolls were arranged with charming effect the reading magdalen caught them next a colored photograph and then a magdalen of more obscure origin in much blackened oils and a very deep frame then still another magdalen more modern in monochrome in fact the room was full of magdalens and on an easel in the corner stood a mater dolorosa lifting up her streaming eyes granting the capacity to take them seriously they might have depressed some people but they elevated miss kimsey she was equally elevated by the imitation willow pattern plates over the door and the painted yellow daffodils on the panels and the orange-coloured revue des deux mondes on the corner of the table and the absence of all bows or draperies from the furniture miss kimsey's own parlour was excrescent with bows and draperies she is above them thought miss kimsey with a little pang the room was so dark that she could not see how old the review was she did not know either that it was always there that unexceptionable parisian periodical with dante in the original and red leather academy notes and the nineteenth century all helping to furnish mrs leslie bell's drawing-room in a manner in accordance with her tastes but if she had miss kimsey would have been equally impressed it took intellect even to select these things the other books miss kimsey noticed by the numbers labelled on their backs were mostly from the circulating library david grieve cometh up as a flower the earthly paradise ruskin's stones of venice marie corelli's romance of two worlds the mantelpiece was arranged in geometrical disorder but it had a gilt clock under a glass shade precisely in the middle when the gilt clock indicated in a mincing way that miss kimsey had been kept waiting fifteen minutes mrs bell came in she had fastened her last button and assumed the expression appropriate to miss kimsey at the foot of the stair she was a tall thin woman with no colour and rather narrow brown eyes much wrinkled round about and a forehead that loomed at you and greyish hair twisted high into a knot behind a knot from which a wispy end almost invariably escaped when she smiled her mouth curved downwards showing a number of large even white teeth and made deep lines which suggested various things according to the nature of the smile on either side of her face as a rule one might take them to mean a rather deprecating acceptance of life as it stands they seemed intended for that and then mrs bell would express an enthusiasm and contradict them as she came through the door under the entry into jerusalem saying that she really must apologize she was sure it was unpardonable keeping miss kimsey waiting like this the lines expressed an intention of being as agreeable as possible without committing herself to return miss kimsey's visit why no mrs bell miss kimsey said earnestly with a protesting buff and gray smile i didn't mind waiting a particle honestly i didn't besides i presume it's early for a call but i thought i'd drop in on my way from school miss kimsey was determined that mrs bell should have every excuse that charity could invent for her she sat down again and agreed with mrs bell that they were having lovely weather especially when they remembered what a disagreeable fall it had been last year certainly this october had been just about perfect the ladies used these superlatives in the tone of mild defiance that almost any statement of fact has upon feminine lips in america it did not seem to matter that their observations were entirely in union 
i thought i'd run in said miss kimsey screwing herself up by the arm of her chair yes and speak to you about a thing i've been thinking a good deal of mrs bell this last day or two it's about elfrida mrs bell's expression became judicial if this was a complaint and she was not accustomed to complaints of elfrida she would be careful how she took it i hope she began oh you needn't worry mrs bell it's nothing about her conduct and it's nothing about her school work well that's a relief said mrs bell as if she had expected it would be but i know she's bad at figures the child can't help that though she gets it from me i think i ought to ask you to be lenient with her on that account i have nothing to do with the mathematical branches mrs bell i teach only english to the senior classes but i haven't heard mr jackson complain of elfrida at all feeling that she could no longer keep her errand at arm's length miss kimsey desperately closed with it i've come i hope you won't mind mrs bell elfrida has been quoting rousseau in her compositions and i thought you'd like to know in the original asked mrs bell with interest i didn't think her french was advanced enough for that no from a translation miss kimsey replied her sentence ran as the gifted jean jacques rousseau told the world in his confessions i forget the rest that was the part that struck me most she had evidently been reading the works of rousseau very likely elfrida has her own subscription at the library mrs bell said speculatively it shows a taste in reading beyond her years doesn't it miss kimsey the child is only fifteen well i've never read rousseau the little teacher stated definitely isn't he atheistical mrs bell and improper every way mrs bell raised her eyebrows and pushed out her lips at the severity of this ignorant condemnation he was a genius miss kimsey rather i should say he is for genius cannot die he is much thought of in france people there make a little shrine of the house he occupied with madame varan you know oh returned miss kimsey french people yes the french are peculiarly happy in the way they sanctify genius said mrs bell vaguely with a feeling that she was wasting a really valuable idea well you'll have to excuse me mrs bell i'd always heard you entertained about as liberal views as there were going on any subject but i didn't expect they embraced rousseau miss kimsey spoke quite meekly i know we live in an age of progress but i guess i'm not as progressive as some many will stay behind interrupted mrs bell impartially but many more will advance and i thought maybe elfrida had been reading that author without your knowledge or approval and that perhaps you'd like to know i neither approve nor disapprove said mrs bell posing her elbow on the table her chin upon her hand and her judgment as it were upon her chin i think her mind ought to develop along the lines that nature intended i think nature is wiser than i am there was an effect of condescending explanation here and i don't feel justified in interfering i may be wrong oh no said miss kimsey but elfrida's reading has always been very general she has a remarkable mind if you will excuse my saying so it devours everything i can't tell you when she learned to read miss kimsey it seemed to come to her she has often reminded me of what you see in the biographies of distinguished people about their youth there are really a great many points of similarity sometimes i shouldn't be surprised if elfrida did anything i wish i had had her opportunities she's growing very good-looking remarked miss kimsey it's an interesting face mrs bell returned here is her last photograph it's full of soul i think she posed herself mrs bell added unconsciously 
it was a cabinet photograph of a girl whose eyes looked definitely out of it dark large well shaded full of desire to be beautiful at once expressed and fulfilled the nose was a trifle heavily blocked but the mouth had sensitiveness and charm there was a heaviness in the chin too but the free springing curve of the neck contradicted that and the symmetry of the face defied analysis it was turned a little to one side wistfully the pose and the expression suited each other perfectly full of soul responded miss kimsey she takes awfully well doesn't she it reminds me it reminds me of pictures i've seen of rachel the actress really it does i am afraid elfrida has no talent that way mrs bell's accent was quite one of regret she seems completely wrapped up in her painting just now said miss kimsey with her eyes still on the photograph yes i often wonder what her career will be and sometimes it comes home to me that it must be art the child can't help it she gets it straight from me but there were no art classes in my day mrs bell's tone implied a large measure of what the world had lost in consequence mr bell doesn't agree with me about elfrida's being predestined for art she went on smiling his whole idea is that she'll marry like other people well if she goes on improving and looks at the rate she has you'll find it difficult to prevent i should think mrs bell miss kimsey began to wonder at her own temerity in staying so long should you be opposed to it oh i shouldn't be opposed to it exactly i won't say i don't expect it i think she might do better myself but i dare say matrimony will swallow her up as it does everybody almost everybody else a finer ear than miss kimsey's might have heard in this that to overcome mrs bell's objections matrimony must take a very attractive form indeed and that she had no doubt it would elfrida's instructress did not hear it she might have been less overcome with the quality of these latter-day sentiments if she had little miss kimsey whom matrimony had not swallowed up had risen to go oh i'm sure the most gifted couldn't do better she said heartily in departing with a blush that turned her from buff and gray to brick color mrs bell picked up the revue after she had gone and read three lines of a paper on the climate and the soil of poland then she laid it down again at the same angle with the corner of the table which it had described before rousseau she said aloud to herself c'est un peu fort mais and paused probably for maturer reflection upon the end of her sentence end of chapter one